Hello, everyone, and welcome to this free webinar with our MAPS coach, Linda McKissick. Today's topic is Profit Share Mastery. Please note this webinar is recorded and will be sent out to you um, today after the webinar has ended. Please feel free to share this recording link with those in your market center and spread the word about how amazing this webinar is today. So uh, if any questions, please email us at fasttrack at kw.com. And that's all for me. So Linda, you can go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Paige. I appreciate it. Uh, good, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm so excited you've joined us for Profit Share Mastery. I'm going to give you as much uh, an overview as I possibly can about what we're all about in Profit Share Mastery. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do uh, at the end, I promise, is I'll share with you how you can join us on our Profit Share Mastery next journey that we're about to start October the 3rd. But what it, my goal for today is to give you as much information as we possibly can and you'd be able to go out there and feel like you can take some action on building your profit share. So I want you to think about this question uh, throughout the whole profit share course. I would go do, start doing this tomorrow, but, and then whatever your but is, is going to be what your question is for me at the very, very end is, because that's going to be your gray space or the area where you're not real clear and you don't feel like you could go take uh, action on this. So it, uh, just getting started, if you can hear me, why don't you kind of real quick type in where you're from so that we have an idea and we can make sure our audio is working uh, clearly and and uh, that we've got people out there listening. <laughs> All right, we got some Omaha, fantastic, Salem, Oregon, Chicago. Arlington, Texas. All right, fantastic. Good. I know you guys can hear me. Welcome, Denver. I'm happy you guys are here. So let's get started. One, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to tell you that because a lot of times people will start saying, well, how do I start a conversation? Uh, and so I'm going to tell you at the very end, I'm going to share with you my two favorite ways to start a conversation. So if you're kind of asking yourself, what, how do I start a conversation? What do I need to say? That's what I'm going to share with you at the very end. But um, I want to give you that information up front so you're not wondering, well, how do I do this that she's talking about, right? Okay, so the first thing I want to start with is um, a, a, a question that I really feel you should keep in front of you at all times, and it's what we call the wealth test question. And the question goes like this. If the financial resources of my real estate business went away at the stroke of midnight, would I have enough passive income to sustain my current lifestyle? So just imagine the people in Houston a few uh, weeks ago. Imagine the people in Puerto Rico. Imagine the people in Florida. They literally had their incomes go away overnight. And so this is the wealth test. And at any time when you ask your, the, yourself this question, and we should ask ourselves this question on a frequent, regular basis, that I can't answer yes, I'm, I feel good, I have enough income to sustain my lifestyle, then we need, we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to go back to work uh, at making sure we have enough passive in income to someday answer that question that, yes, I would be absolutely fine. So part of what we want to uh, encourage you today to do is to look at profit share as a way to be able to answer that question in a positive manner. And so we're going to share with you the ways that we feel is the best for you to build that profit share dollar amount to enough that you could answer this uh, question very positively. So let me start by sharing you, with you my journey and what got me to be kind of uh, passionate about the subject of passive income and also tagged as the queen of passive income. So, um, and really what, what led us probably ultimately to be able to be uh, known as the number one profit share earners in Keller Williams. It was because of this journey I truly believe that to the depths of my soul I felt with a conviction that that I should look at profit share seriously and I should treat it as a business. So 1986 uh, in Texas, the economy was crashing. Uh, I, I like to say I was 23 years old and didn't even know what the word economy meant, much less whether it was a good economy or a bad economy. But my husband was in the restaurant and nightclub business and I knew something was seriously wrong because he started not wanting to go to bed at night. And I would soon find out as he confessed to me that we were $600,000 upside down in debt that the reason he didn't want to go to bed at night is because it made morning come too soon. And when morning came quickly, the bankers always started calling. And so he was in a very bad place, a very dark place, because he didn't know how we were going to get out of this $600,000 debt that we woke up what felt like almost overnight in. 
And so he looked at me and said, you know, I need your help. I need you to go to work and help me climb out of this massive hole that we're in. And for whatever reason, you know, instinct, insight, uh, I decided I would ask his opinion about what he thought I should be able to do to help him do that. Uh, and, I, you know, I always laugh and say I'm usually not that good at listening to what uh, he tells me to do. But for some reason, um, you know, I felt that he would probably have the answer the right answer for me and so I asked him what do you think I should do you know I'm a hard worker I've always had one or two jobs my whole life but I've never made really honestly a whole lot more than minimum wage so what do you think I should do and he looked at me and said a mentor of his told him a long time ago if you want to make a lot of money that real estate is the way to do it and so we laugh today because <clears throat> looking back on who that mentor was that mentor was actually a big real estate developer out of Dallas Texas the man was probably trying to tell Jimmy to buy some real estate, not put your wife to work in real estate. But I'm going to tell you, I'm kind of glad we missed the mark on that because real estate to me is the best uh, career anyone could possibly have because there's no limit on what we can make. We get to decide what our future looks like, uh, good or bad, right? And so I didn't even know I could sell anything. The most I'd ever sold was a hamburger, and that wasn't that hard because most people were driving to where I worked to pick up that hamburger. And so um, I didn't do very good in the very beginning. I only sold, <clears throat> made about $3,000 gross in commission. Jimmy said that was extremely gross because he owed 600 and I was making 3000 and it was costing him 15000 for me to make 3000 So he very quickly informed me we were going the wrong direction. But there was something about real estate that really resonated with me. I liked, and I knew if I could ever get around people who knew how to do it at a high level that I could master it also. Kind of like you guys are on the call today because you want to master profit share. And so hopefully you see me as someone <clears throat> that has figured it out and can share my knowledge and my information with you. And I believe that's the fastest way to anything we want uh, in life, whatever we're trying to accomplish. So sure enough, I found a few trainers, read, uh, read a few books, found a few high producers that would share knowledge with me, and I was very quickly on my way to building a very big real estate business. I would eventually take that business to over 200 transactions a year and list over 200 properties a year. Now, most people would have thought all problems solved, end of the game, no need to do anything else. But in the back of my mind, I remembered the pain of being everything going away overnight, and I wanted to try to discover how in the world do you not ever get in that position again? And so uh, we eventually took our team to seventh level. I was the very first per person that Gary Keller coached to take their business to the seventh level. And our business has been running at the seventh level for about 20 years now. So um, we're proof that if you just pay attention to, to what Keller says, it does actually work. And I want to share with you, because I, everybody's on this call at different places in their life, and I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter if you're young starting out. It doesn't matter if you feel like you've missed the mark and you're older starting out. Because here's the reality. What we did was we got seriously focused. Uh, and for a good five to seven years, we did nothing but focus on exactly uh, what it was going to take to make this be our future uh, income. And so if you fast forward to today, we went from $600,000 in debt in the late 80s and early 90s to over $4 million a year in passive income. And I want to point out that 1.4 million of that is from Keller Williams profit share. So I love this opportunity. I think everybody should be taking advantage of the opportunity, and I'm passionate about helping you do it the right way. And I will tell you, we wouldn't have been able to do any of these things if we hadn't done this first, which is uh, build. It you know we had to build a real successful real estate team first. That's what opened the doors for all these other opportunities. So you're on the right path. I just want you to include in your daily activities this gift of profit share. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, you, you do that. So the definition, you know, I believe if you're headed some way, if, you, if you're trying to get somewhere, if you're trying to accomplish something, it's really a good idea to know how will I know when I'm actually there? How will I measure it? How will I be for sure that I am where I'm trying to be. So we looked up what a definition of a wealthy person is, and we believe that it's when your passive income exceeds the income necessary to fund your lifestyle and provide you freedom of your time and money. 
so that you can do that what it is that's important to you and so really that's the destination that we're headed to we want to have enough passive income coming in passively that we can fund whatever lifestyle we really want I always like to say if you don't like the one you have then design the one you want and figure out how much money would we have to create passively for you to have the freedom of your time and money to have that lifestyle and so that's how we're going to know that we're actually there uh, that we've arrived and I, I'm a big fan of every time I see something that reminds me of this I always get it and put it in front of me because building wealth and passive income is something that is long term and when something is long term we tend to not think about it and wealth is not something you can um, you know kind of cram it the night before which is my MO I like to cram if I took a test tomorrow I'd be cramming tonight uh, so wealth is unfortunately not one of those things you can do that so I bought this magnet in San Diego recently it says based on my calculations I can retire about five years after I die had a friend of mine say the other day she said I think you've miscalculated I think it's more like 10 most people can retire 10 years after they die so I love this and I keep it in front of me so that it always reminds me that this is where my life is headed by default if I don't do something different and so I this is this is the default place that it will go unless I take control and make sure that something else happens differently so we when we begin on our journey we really started trying to figure out okay how do we figure out never to be those people that have this happen to them again so some of you on the call may have actually even had you know lost everything in the crash of the late 80s and early 90s or maybe you lost everything in 2008 2009 you know, at some point in our life, Gary Keller says, if you live long enough, we're going to experience everything, right? And so we're going to experience a crash or two. And so what we did is we went and sought out the, the books that would help us understand who are the people that are more resilient in these periods or who are the people that this really doesn't happen to. They're kind of immune to it. And what we discovered is in the book, Cash Flow Quadrant, so um, I'd like for you to kind of reach out to me and give me a yes or no if you've ever read Cashflow Quadrant. Most people read Robert Kiyosaki's first book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, and so very few actually read Cashflow Quadrant. So I'd like to just kind of take a poll. Uh, if you can um, kind of give me a yes or no on the, in the questions box of whether you've ever read the book Cashflow Quadrant. So I'm going to wait just a second to kind of get that. Uh, information and I'll read it back to you but uh, in the meantime what I want to share with you is when we read this a hundred percent of our money came from the bottom left quadrant which is the self-employed quadrant because Jim and I both were selling real estate by this time and we both got a hundred percent of our money uh, from being self-employed and so um, most people are going to be on the left side 95 percent of the world is going to be on the left side and only 5% is going to get their money from the right side. Okay, I'm a little worried. Nobody's answered yes or no if you've read Cash Flow Quadrant. So why don't you give me a shout out if you can hear me? Oh, wait, here we go. Yeah, I see him now. There we go. Uh, I have not read this. Yes, I've got a few yeses, quite a few noes. Uh, well, here's the good news. I'm going to give you the main points of the book, so it's up to you whether you pick it up and read it. Uh, because the bottom line of this, what this taught us was uh, it taught us that even though our money came in from the left quadrant, we needed to figure out how to get as much of it as we possibly could coming in from the right side. Didn't mean we had to abandon, abandon the left side, just mean we needed more coming in from the right side because that's, that's called passive money and that's where um, money's working for you or people working for you. So uh, what we did was we read this book and we understood what our challenge was. Our challenge was all of our money came from the left side and so our goal would be to get as much money over the next, you know, so many years coming from the right side. And so that means we either, uh, we're going to have to learn what, what are the ways to get money coming from that right side. And what we discovered was there was actually only three ways to build wealth. And I don't know about you guys, but if I have a million ways to do something, I will freeze and won't do any of them. But if I've only got three, I can make a decision. I can take a step forward. And so when we really understood wealth, there's only three ways to build it. You can buy stocks, you can buy real estate, or you can buy businesses. And I'm going to tell you, we looked into stocks, and the problem we found with stocks for us, uh, this won't necessarily mean it's the truth for you, but it was the truth for us, is we weren't willing to learn a lot about it, and we couldn't buy enough of it to control it. So based on those two things, we would be more like speculators, not investors. And so 
people lose everything when they speculate. They don't. We we've never lost anything when we truly understood the investment and we invested wisely. So uh, we said stocks really wouldn't be the one for us because we're not willing to learn it and we don't think we can buy enough con to control it. So we've got one bit of stock advice for you from the McKissick Group, and that is this. The McKissick stock advice is whatever we buy, absolutely buy the opposite because um, I'm going to tell you we're the people that sold Facebook uh, when we should have, and I'm going to leave it at that. So don't ever, if we, if we start to give you stock advice, run the other way, right? But real estate, however, makes a lot more sense, right? Real estate is a next natural step for us in the real estate business. So, but what I'm going to encourage you to do is I'm going to encourage you to build your profit share first and use the money from profit share to invest in real estate. Because when we wrote the book Hold, How to Find, Buy, and Rent Houses to Build Wealth, and when we traveled around the country and we taught to real estate agents about real estate investing, the number one reason people said they did not invest in real estate is they didn't have the money. So if we will build our profit share first, we will solve that problem and then we'll get some type of infinity return because we're using money that is coming in passively to us to buy another uh, passive asset. So here's our key on, on that. You can read the book Hold if you want to. I'm just going to kind of give you the highlights real quick because we're not here to really learn about this as much as we are profit share. But number one, never be over leveraged. That's what's going to keep you safe. That's what's going to keep you uh, secure and no matter what happens in the market. And so uh, you, you either need to buy a house below market or buy a house uh, a little bit less below market and put more money down. Either way, we'll get you to that 70 to 30 loan to value ratio. And the main thing to understand is you don't have any excuses for not buying real estate. It is your business. And so it's a next natural door for us. But again, if you haven't started investing already, I'm going to encourage you to do profit share first and then use that money for uh, real estate. So let's look at businesses. Businesses are people making you money. Profit share, we think, should be treated as a standalone business. And so if you treat it as a standalone business, the beautiful thing about it is there's no liability, there's no uh, risk, and uh, there's no big upfront cash investment on this type of business. Whereas if I was going to do any other type of business, I'd have to go rent the space, have some money for capital expenses and different things like that. So here's the thing about owning a business. If you're going to treat your real estate business as a business uh, or do profit share, it's a good idea. You need to get really good at selling real estate because that is the, that is the leeway into this opportunity. And then you need to get, uh, you need to get, number one, get really good at selling real estate. And you also need to get really good at attracting talented people, whether you're going to build a business on your real estate team uh, or you're going to recruit people to Keller Williams, the better you can get at attracting talented people, the better you're going to, the more successful you're going to be at this. So I want to share a real quick story with you to bring home the importance of how valuable our profit share system can be for you and your family. This is my family. It's kind of a little bit older picture, but it's my family. And all of us remember 9-11, right? 9-11 changed our our country. It changed our security, it changed everything forever, right? Well, 9-11-2012 changed my family forever. And the reason it changed my family forever is because we got a call like that my pastor likes to call, one that will bring you to your knees. And the call came from my daughter who told us that our uh, son-in-law, uh, who was 29 at the time, had just been diagnosed with cancer for the second time. And he had been given 10 to 10 and a half months to live. And so we did like any family would want to do. We packed up our car. They were living six hours south of us with his parents. And we packed up our car and we moved in with our son-in-law, our daughter, and our granddaughter for uh, almost the whole time. We were, we were back in our home about three and a half uh, weeks of all of that time. And we did like any family would do. We wanted to be there. We wanted to help him. We wanted to help them because it does take a village during this type of situation. And I'm going to tell you, during that period, that 10 and a half months, profit share, our, our, our profits went up, our net worth went up, and our businesses grew. And none of those are the best thing. The best thing is we have no regrets because we got our life and our time back to be where we needed to be for as long as we needed to be there. So as Gary Keller always says, number one, I hope this never happens to you and your family, but we do know for sure, because Gary says this all the time, if you live long enough, you will experience everything. And some of those things are going to need more of your time and more of your money. 
So in real estate, we have what we call the realtor dilemma. And the realtor dilemma is this. The day you pick up your last sign is the last dollar you will ever make in real estate. And so this is another sign that I think you should keep in front of you because I think we sometimes think that 50 more houses or 100 more houses will solve all of our problems. Uh, and the truth is, it won't because, number one, we can't save our way to wealth. And um, since we can't save our way to wealth, we really couldn't ever sell enough houses to be wealthy and to give us that uh, security and that passive income that we, that we need. So how many of you on the call, I'd like to take a poll. Um, I'd like to take a poll of, of you, what you think, Gary, when he polls the audience, they say. So at the end of Mega Camp every year, we didn't, we didn't have it this year because we had Mega Relief, but uh, if you'd been there last year or any other year before, uh, Gary always asks on the very last day, the very last hour of Mega Camp, okay, what's the single most dollar productive thing an agent in Keller Williams can do? And so what I'd love for you is to take a, 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 to a poll and what do you think the audience shouts back to Gary when he asks this question? What do, you, what do you think the audience believes is the single most dollar productive thing a Keller Williams agent can do? Uh, hire someone, that's absolutely definitely a, a very dollar productive thing that he would normally tell us to do. Absolutely lead gen, uh, own real estate, absolutely. Uh, share the opportunity is absolutely the right answer he's looking for. He says if you are a Keller Williams agent, it's been mathematically proven that the most dollar productive thing you can do is uh, recruit uh, an agent to Keller Williams. So because of that, I think if we understood it to be the most dollar productive thing, if we really believe that in our heart and soul, we would be spending some of our time on building that and on doing that. So first thing I want to change for you is the mindset of it is the most dollar productive thing. So you are not being not dollar productive if you spend time and energy around this activity. All right, so um, yeah, absolutely. Everybody would have thought lead gen. And by the way, he says lead gen is, is important and dollar productive. However, mathematically, it's been proven with Keller Williams agents, you can make more money. And so here, I'm a witness to this. Uh, I'm gonna tell you in all my years of selling real estate, I've made more money off my relationships with other agents than I have all my buyers and sellers. And remember, I sold over 200 homes a year, year after year. So that's a pretty powerful statement. And that's a pretty powerful testimony. So that's why we have to understand it is dollar productive and anything that's dollar productive is worth you learning and, and figuring out how to do and spending time on. So let's go into what is profit share. Um, Profit share is the income you, because a lot of times, you know, we hear what we think profit share is and we have misconceptions about it and the, the outside people say terrible things about it. And so I want to get some clarity around what is actually profit share. And I'm going to share you, with you what I believe profit share is. Profit share is the income you receive as your reward for helping the company grow. Profit share is your way of changing lives and making a difference for people in our industry and getting paid passively for doing it. I always like to say that I sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes year after year, so that comes into the thousands of homes. And in all those years, I never once had a buyer or seller look me in the eye with tears in their eyes and say, thank you, Linda, you changed my life and my family's life. They said, best real estate transaction ever, we will, we will always use you. We send everybody we know to you. They said all those things, but they never looked at me with tears in their eyes and said, thank you, you changed my life and you changed my family's life. However, people that I brought into Keller Williams have looked at me with tears in their eyes and said, thank you, you changed my life and you changed my family's life for generations. So I want to say this to you one more time. Profit share is your way of changing lives. It's what's going to give us significance in this industry making a difference for people in our industry and getting paid passively for it. In turn, this changes your life and becomes the legacy for your family because profit share is, uh, is willable to your heirs. You have to make sure it's in your will and uh, it is 
generate at least one generation. I'm not sure exactly how many generations you can pass it down, but uh, so you want to be sure that you understand while you're spending time. It's not only the most dollar productive thing Gary Keller says you can do as a Keller Williams agent, but you're also creating a legacy for your family. So what is profit share to you right now? And I'm going to ask this question. I want you to type in answers. Whether you get profit share so far or you don't, what are you using it for? What uh, will you use it for? And the reason I ask this question while you're thinking of your answers is when I polled the people in my region a few years ago, the top profit share earners said two things. One, they had the money earmarked for something that was emotionally important to them, like family vacations, a kid to college, a wedding, pay off a car, help an elderly parent, something that was emotionally important to them. They made more money because of that. Number two, they also earmarked it into a special account and did not commingle it with their other money. So um, that is why I ask you, what is profit share to you right now? So who's willing to share what it is? Uh, some people say it's just a dream I don't yet have, and that's absolutely okay because we get what we focus on, right? And I'm going to teach you how to focus on it right. So good news is we're not going to have to change any of your bad habits, right? Fun family vacations, absolutely, because you're going to make uh, you're going to make memories for a lifetime with your family when you're able to take them on on vacations that that they, that's important to them. College fund, retirement fund, absolutely. So earmark these for things that are very important to you. Uh, and uh, future stability, real estate investing, absolutely. These are all good emotional reasons that, because remember, it's been proven, and I think Daniel Kahneman even got a Nobel Prize on it in economics for understanding that people move on emotion and they justify with logic. So this is what you want to get connected to because it's going to cause you uh, to, uh, to really take action on this. So a lot of great ideas, taking off, uh, for two years and travel the world. Those are all things that are possible if you build your profit share. So here's five things that profit share is not. Number one, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Uh, it's, it, you know, we've been at this a long time. I will tell you, uh, we are, uh, I'm going to make a confession. The first four years I was with Keller Williams, I wouldn't let anybody explain profit share to me, and I thought it was a hoaxy thing, and I didn't think I needed it, so I wasn't interested in it. So I didn't even get started right when I joined Keller Williams. It took me a good another four years uh, to even start being willing to look at it. And then it was in 2007 that I got really, really, really serious about it. So it's not a get rich quick scheme. <clears throat> it's a get rich slow scheme. Not it's a get rich slow plan. Let's say that because there's no scheme in it. And then it's not a pyramid scheme. It's not built in such a way that only the people at the top get the most money. It really is rewarding the people who do the work. So it's effort in, effort out. It's effort in, uh, reward out. So do not, um, it's not, you know, any kind of pyramid thing where the people at the top are getting richer because people at the bottom are pushing them up. It doesn't have to take away from your real estate business. And this is probably the biggest uh, um, missed misnomer that is around profit share that I would love to clear up. It's not either or, it's and. So in other words, I want to share with you how you can do this while you do your everyday real estate business. Because the reality is that time is our biggest issue and we all only uh, have 24 hours. I didn't get 36 and you didn't get 24. You didn't get 20 and I got 24. The truth is we all got the same 24 hours. And so what I want to teach you to do is how do you do this in your what you're already doing in your day-to-day -day business? Uh, it doesn't um, only work for the agents who came into KW first. Matter of fact, if you really chart the people who are behind me making money, they've actually made more money at the same time frame than, I, than we made. So it doesn't only work for the <clears throat> agents who came in first because that's a big <clears throat> fallacy that people buy into and this one would cost you a lot if you believed it. Because there are people that have been in, if you took the same time period I was in KW and the time they're in, they're making a lot more money than I am. <clears throat> Gary Keller even says he believes 
that the number one profit share earner is not even with Keller Williams yet. So isn't that pretty powerful? Matter of fact, one of the number one profit share earners could be one of you. It's all about you deciding that it's going to be you. Okay? You don't personally have to recruit thousands to make any money. I want you to guess real quick. Um, how many of you want to guess how many people we have in our front line? So go ahead and type in the question box, how many people do you believe for us to make a million four last year and on target for about a million six something this year, how many of you believe uh, 200, uh, somebody believes we have 200, some said 11, some said 15. Um, the reality is, some, someone said, Ben said 50, uh, Andy said 40, Martin said 50. These are all great guesses, and the real number is, actually it says 33, but the real number, we just got someone the other day, so it's, the real number now is 34. So 33 uh, is what we had up to make to the million four, now we've added one more person. So 33 people is all we had to have, uh, is what we had to get to that uh, million, over that million dollar mark. However, because this thing can go wide and deep, you make the most money from your bottom people, which I don't have any control of, right? I only have control of the people I build a relationship with and I bring into the company on my first level. Uh, total three, we probably have about eight or 9,000 total. But again, I didn't really have anything to do with that. It took a life of its own to get there. Okay, so here's the thing. You get to have negative leads or positive leads. It's up to you. And I truly believe that... Um, that it's negative beliefs, that as long as we hold on to negative beliefs, it holds us back and keeps us from getting the results that we want. So what I want to do is kind of address beliefs just a minute, because I believe 80% of whether I accomplish anything or not in life is what kind of beliefs I hold to on to around it. So, um, so let's talk about the beliefs around why profit share or what it really is. So profit share is how Keller Williams makes their associates partners in the growth of the company. So we're not a pyramid, we're not a cult, we're not any of those things, uh, it's not a scheme, it's really how Keller Williams makes their associates partners, and it also supports the company's belief that the agent is a stakeholder in the business with the company. So I made a sign a few years ago and gave it to my leadership team, and it said, from the outside looking in, we're hard to understand, and from the inside looking out, we're hard to explain. That's really the way Keller Williams is. So I want you to memorize and understand what the, this statement about profit share because that's going to be your answer when people ask you what is profit share. So it supports the company's belief that the agent is a stakeholder in the business with the company. It's a gift that very few companies offer its people, but I will tell you the ones that do um, are the best companies to work for. They're the best companies in profit. There's so many great validations on why sharing your profit is a great business strategy. Okay, so I'm going to share with you now our top secret recruiting formula uh, because I believe um, having watched people do it wrong in a lot of different ways that um, it's a lot simpler than people really, really think it is. So I'm going to ask you now, are you sure you really want to see this? Because this is, once you know this, you can't pretend you don't, right? So give me, a, give me a shout out if you really are excited about knowing this secret formula. Because I don't know about you, but I like secret, you know, formulas. So yep, we got some yeps coming in. Yes, yes, we got some, a lot of, please, please, please. Okay, all right. Yes, all right. Well, are you really, really, really sure you want to see it? I mean, is that you guys? I'm thinking from listening to some of your explanation marks and your answers here, this is what you're looking like in the audience. You are really ready for this magic formula. All right, so there you go. I want you to have it memorized by the time we get off the webinar. It's a test coming right after this. Uh, no, the truth is we kind of decided this is what the formula looks like for the, the computer in Austin to try to figure out where all this money goes, right? Uh, but our formula is not near as complicated, so you can kind of have a sigh of relief. Our formula is this, and I'm going to tell you, this is the very same formula that I use to sell over 200 homes a year, year after year. It's also the formula that if you hired me today to go sell widgets anywhere, this is exactly the same formula I would fall back into because it's tried and true and it works for me in profit share, works for me in sales, it works for me in everything I'm trying to do. And so this is the formula. It's called relationships plus validity plus value over time. 
relationships plus validity plus value over time. And I encourage you to put this up in front of you so when you're in doubt, this is the formula that you follow, whether it's your real estate business or building your profit share tree. So let's go into this a little bit and get some clarity around it. So let's start with relationships. Um, most agents believe that their relationships with buyers and sellers are more important and more valuable than the relationship with the agent on the other side. And I'm going to tell you that I've made more money off my off building relationships with other realtors than I ever have long term with buyers and sellers. And we know how hard it is to work with buyers and sellers. So this is a pretty profound statement I'm making to you. And the reason I know that we believe that the relationship with the buyers and sellers are more important is because of the way we treat other agents and the time we put into other agents. Because uh, if we believe they were more valuable, we would treat them differently. So I would hope to change your view on the importance and the value of building great relationships with other realtors. All right? And so um, the other thing I would like to add about relationship, and I want you to make a note of this somewhere, is I'm going to ask you, until you get really, really good at this, I want you to pick five people, five realtors out there to build a relationship with. Uh, not 10, not 20, not 50. I, today, still only have 12 on my whiteboard. And I keep them on a whiteboard because if they're out of sight, they're out of mind for me. So I'm going to encourage you to start with five. And then once this becomes a habit and ingrained in you, you can move that number up. But right now, let's just pick five. So um, I want you to pick those five. Uh, and I want you to understand that relationships take time. And it's kind of like scuba diving, not water skiing. So that's another reason why we're only going to pick five. We don't have time to go deep with 50, but we can find time to go deep with five, right? So if you've scuba dived, you know that's wonderful. The whole goal is to get down deep and see what is magical and beautiful down there. But if you've water skied, you know the goal is to stay on top and not get down uh, too far in the water because that's when you're doing something wrong. And so what we're going to talk about is scuba diving, not water skiing. And when you pick your five, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to pick five people around your current production. Five people around your current production. A few below and a few above. And the reason I'm going to have you pick a few above and a few below is because of this thing called validity. Okay, and I'll explain just a little bit more in a minute. So validity is the ability to get people to know you, like you, and trust you enough to open the door to a relationship. So the way I know I'm valid to someone is how fast does that door swing, how fast does that door to that relationship swing open? How fast does that door to that relationship swing open? That's going to know, let me know, either I have enough validity or I need to add some validity, okay? And so here's the thing I say about validity. Everybody has it and nobody thinks they do. Everyone has it and no one thinks they do. And so here's what I want you to think about to think about your validity. I want you, and matter of fact, I want you to shout out to me in the question box, what is something that you currently help another agent in Keller Williams do? What, it could be recent. It could be something they come to you all the time about. But I don't care if you're a productivity coach, a team leader, an MCA, uh, agent, whoever you are on this call, type in the question box if you would, what is something that you currently have helped another Keller Williams agent with or that people come to you for? So I'm going to give you just a minute to be shouting that out to me in the questions box. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other places that your validity can come from other than yourself. So let's... Um, Look and see what we what we have here. Okay, so I've got scripts. Uh, some of you help new agents with contracts. Uh, you've helped them make accountability. You've helped get a listing. You've helped mindset. You've helped them with CMAs, keep them accountable, role play, door knocking. Wow, you guys are killing it. I love this. Tech support. Uh, Admin, tech form, script, support, accountability. I love it because everything you're currently doing inside Keller Williams, how many of you believe there's somebody outside of Keller Williams that needs that same help that would love for you to help them also? So that's what your validity can do is you're just going to learn how to do it outside of KW 
like you're doing it inside KW. Because here's the thing. People don't do what we tell them. Buyers don't buy, sellers don't sell, and agents don't join Keller Williams uh, because we tell them to. They do what they self-discover they need to do to get what they want to get. So part of what we're going to use validity for is to, and people self-discover in three ways, stories, experiences, and questions. And so because of that, and because we know that, we're going to, when we help someone else outside of KW, we show them what a relationship inside KW looks and feels like. And every time they go back to their, their company, they will be reminded that they don't experience that where they are. And I'll cover that a little bit more when I get into value, okay? So validity can also come from your accomplishments, knowledge, language, experiences, all the things that you currently have. But it also can come from, doesn't have to be your own. It could be the company's validity like classes and books or just a little piece of a material from a class you go to or other people in the company. And so what I want you to get really, really good at is identifying what validity is needed and then figuring out how to find it if you don't have it available to you, if it's not coming from you or something that you have experience with. All right? And so I love this part about value. Zig Ziglar was one of my favorite, favorite old-time uh, motivational speakers, and, and this is my, one of my favorite things he ever said. If you can, you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And so that's what we do on the value piece of this formula. What we do is figure out what is of value to the, 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 per, the agent we're building a relationship with, and here's the truth about value. You don't get to decide what value is to the recruit. They do. And this is a place where we make a mistake. We get excited about what we think is of value to Keller Williams, and we start trying to throw it up all over the potential recruit. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do is pick the relationships, start building the relationships, get in great conversations with the people, and in those conversations, you're going to pull out of them what is their value gap, what is their most current value gap. So I'm going to share a story with you to make this come home. When I joined Keller Williams, I was the number one agent in my city. And if you had been trying to recruit me with Keller Williams, you more than likely would have tried to uh, recruit me and sell me on the fact that I would save $80,000 the day I joined Keller Williams. I had paid my company $100,000 to be there. And I was only going to pay Keller Williams with royalty and everything at that time, 21. And so you would have really been trying to sell me on that. And that would have been a very big mistake. And the reason it would have been a mistake is because that was not my highest value gap at that time. Now, would it become important to me later? Yes, absolutely. But the biggest value gap I had at the time was I wanted to be with a company that would support me in building a big brand and a big name recognition that anybody in my town recognized as real estate. And so I was constantly having to fight my current company over who was the brand, and it was getting old, and I was getting tired of it. And that would have been the best value for you to help me self-discover about Keller Williams. So if this is making sense to you, type in yes uh, so I can kind of make sure you're following along. And remember, be thinking of your questions. Because at the very end, I'm going to ask your question. I would go start doing this tomorrow, but, and then I'm going to try to answer as many of those questions as you possibly can, as I possibly can during our time. So let's talk about the last part of the formula, which is time. Uh, if you will build deep relationships, have validity, and provide value over time, you will recruit great agents. You will get people. It's, it, it's just a magic formula because what happens when you pour into these people, you create this beautiful thing called beholdedness. If you've ever read the book Persuasion, he talks about reciprocity and the power of reciprocity. That's what this is going to do. Have you ever had somebody give you and give time and things to you and you feel so indebted that you want to give back to them, that you almost can't stand that they keep giving 
because you want to give back to them in some way. It's a very powerful motivator and it's very underutilized and underrealized. And so uh, that's why it will take care of itself over time if you just do what I'm telling you here. Because my philosophy is you can't outgive what you're going to get. It just is not possible. I think the way the world is made, it's made in such a way that you just can't do it. So don't worry about what you're going to get. Just worry about what you're going to give. Okay. Uh, and so the way people feel love is what? T-I-M-E. That's how people spell love. And so we're going to pour that time into them. But remember, we're going to do it in the course of our already productive day, not an and. Not we're going to find a few extra hours to do this. So I'm going to give you a few examples in just a minute. But first, let me kind of tell you some of the mistakes that we're making. The four most common types of uh, mistakes uh, or the, the way people are recruiting now is this. Number one, and I want you to identify which one and type in the box which one you think you are. You can just do KDF if you think you're a Kalahari Dung Fighter. <laughs> and if you've ever watched the Discovery Channel or History Channel, on one of them, it's on there. If not, Google Kalahari Dung Fighter and you'll very quickly get a, a visual of what this is. And I want this to be impactful because I want us to stop it. But a Kalahari Dung Fighter does exactly what the name says. It stores up dung and when a predator or someone gets alongside of it, it makes it anxious or excited, it flings its dung all over it. And so I want you to never be a Kalahari Dung Fighter. That's why it's so graphic and so important that you identify if that's the one you're, and by the way, we've all done some of them at some time, right? And the second one is called sell and tell, and that's where you just are so excited about something yourself that you sell and tell and sell and tell and sell and tell. Sell and tell doesn't work in our sales business, and it doesn't work in building a big profit share tree also. So really, people self-discover from questions, experiences, and stories. So sell and tell really doesn't even play into this formula at all. And then the next one that I find people really uh, are, make the mistake of is they think if they'll learn a magic script, they'll be able to recruit uh, anyone. And remember, you're not good enough to make people buyers buy, sellers sell, or agents join. There is no magic script that will make you do that. And if you're waiting for it, you're going to be waiting a long time. And so the last one is the one I'm most guilty of. It's the one that's always painful for me when I teach it or when I think about it. And uh, so um, the, this one's called a pre-decider. And so this is the last one of, of, the, of the, the, the ways we are recruiting right now. And so I want you to type in the box, you know, which one you think you are, you're most guilty of. But this one is where you believe that someone, because their mother owns the brokerage, they've been at this company for 30 plus years, uh, they're happy where they're at, they've got everything they want, all the many reasons that we pre-decide, you're pre-deciding that someone won't join Keller Williams. So I'm going to share with you my story, my painful, painful story about being a pre-decider. So I had built a relationship with a lady for many, many years in a mastermind group together. And I had pre-decided that she would not join Keller Williams because she had owned a Keller Williams franchise. And in, I mean, not a Keller Williams, sorry, a Remax franchise. And in that Remax franchise, uh, I remember how miserable she was and how much she hated it. So I pre went ahead and pre-decided for Terry that she would never join Keller Williams. So about nine years ago, I get a phone call from Terry. And she says, hey, Linda, this is Terry Moeller. And uh, I'm going to be in Austin next week. And I would want to know if you would be possibly, would it be possible for you to get me in front of Gary Keller uh, while I'm there? And I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to be there also. And I not only can get you in front of Gary Keller, I'll get you in front of Mo Anderson, I'll get you in front of Mark Willis, and I'll get you in front of Mary Tennant. And I did all the above, as I should, because she's fabulous. Our company is better because she's with us. Now we take vacations together, we spend a lot of time together, I love this woman, and it's very painful every time I see her because I have to be reminded that I pre-decided, and she joined our company, and she's in someone else's downline, as she should be, because I did not get her to Austin. I just helped use my validity to get her into the meetings that she needed to make a decision. So please, please, please don't pre-decide. And I see some of you have already been guilty of it. So this is your warning. Don't do that. All right, because I have my painful story that I'm sure you probably have some also. Um, all right, so about 2000, I want you to tell me what year you see on this check. If you can see this check really good, type in 
your question box um, of what year you think uh, you can tell I wrote this check. What year did I write this check that I was going to make a million dollars, pay myself a million dollars from Tolium's profit share? So if you can see it, type in what year that is. Okay, so 2007, absolutely right. That's exactly when I did it. So 2007, I made a decision. I had a really bad real estate transaction that day. Any of you ever have a really bad real estate transaction and ask yourself, remind me why I keep doing this again? Uh, well, I had one of those days, and so it made me really look up and say, okay, I want to treat profit share more as a standalone business, and I want to make big goals, and I want to go after them. So I looked up the person who could help me the most, and I said, um, I need to make a, I want to, I not need to, I want to make a million dollars in Keller Williams profit share, and I need you to tell me what I need to do. I'm a what do I need to do kind of person, and I don't need all the other ha details and all that stuff, just tell me what to do. And so I'll never forget, and I said, hey, by the way, you can work on this for a few weeks if you need to and get back to me. I know it's got to be kind of complicated. And he looked at me and said, I don't need to work on it. I know exactly what you need to do. You need to go get 20 people, help 20 get 20, and get 5,000 total. I very quickly programmed that into my Nokia flip phone I had at the time. And every day I flipped that phone up, I saw get 20, help 20, get 20, 5,000 total. And I looked at it every single day. I also put this check outside my office, and I always looked at it when I went into my office. So I'm going to ask you to take this serious, to make a big commitment. And I want you to also think about a time in your life that you have made a big commitment. And the way you know it's a big commitment is because the minute you make it, you drop into this awful, awful place called courage. And so the way to understand courage is this. The difference between courage and fear is this. Fear is when you have just wet your pants because of the commitment you made. And courage is when you go ahead and do the commitment with those wet pants, right? We've all been there. And what happens and the reason it takes courage is because when we make that commitment, we don't have all the details. We don't have all the credentials. And so because we don't have all those credentials, it's scary. It's hard. It's scary thinking what, how we're going to do it. But what happens is we figure out the credentials along the way. And then what happens is we get to go into this wonderful, beautiful place called confidence. And confidence, when we get more confidence, allows us to go out and make bigger and stronger commitments. And that's how our life really, really gets big instead of staying small. And so I want to warn you against the fifth C, which is called complacency. Because if you continue to stay in complacency, you're going to continue to, to keep your life smaller than it could be if you were constantly making big commitments that took courage. So I want you to type uh, a big commitment in the question box, a big commitment that you've, that you've made somewhere in your life so you can identify back with that. And from that, it took a lot of courage. You maybe even wet your pants, but you went ahead and figured out the credentials and got the confidence. And so I want you to give me a type in the question box a time when you did that. I'm going to share with you real quick. When I made the decision to take my to hire my first assistant, that was a big commitment. It took courage. When I decided to take my business to the seventh level at about 200 transactions a year, that scared the crap out of me because I thought Brad was going to run off all my business and it was not going to work. I thought Gary Keller was crazy and he had no idea what he was talking about. So I want you to really understand this because to decide you're going to do this, picking up and moving, yes, that's a big commitment. Uh, you know, here's the thing. You can go back and think of big commitments that you made You've made them before in your past, and a lot of times, nine times out of ten, what really came from it is something amazing and awesome, and so that's what's going to happen here when you make this kind of commitment also. Yeah. All right, so here's my question to you. If not now, then when? If not now, then when? KW is the number one training company in the world. We are killing our closest competition in many areas. KW is the number one in agent count. We are going for the trifecta. We profit shared 154 million last year, guys. 154, we're on target for 160 or 170 million this year. That's a lot of money. And only you get to decide how much of that you're going to get. I decided how much I was going to get. You can decide how much you're going to get. 
And so I want to share with you my two favorite skips because hopefully you've kind of thought about your five people so far and now you're wondering how am I going to start a conversation with them. And remember con in Spanish means with. So with doesn't mean you just drill them with questions and they do all the talking, but it also doesn't mean you, it's verse stations and you do all the talking. What it means is about 90% is them doing the talking, so that means you've got to have good questions to ask them. And 10% you lobbing in stuff every so often so they feel like they're in a conversation with you. All right? So here are my two favorite opening scripts that actually work. So tip script number one, start the conversation with a compliment. Here's the thing about compliments, guys. Nobody gets enough of them and nobody ever gets tired of them. So compliments are a beautiful way to conversation starters. But there's two real key components to it. Number one, it must be sincere and it must be genuine. And trust me, if you think long enough, you're going to get in the habit of, of identifying compliments for people. You're just not in the habit because we're not treating these relationships with the, um, with the importance that we really, really should. We're not focusing on how important they really are to us, all right? So here's how that script would go. Hey, Press, this is Linda, and I just wanted to take a minute and thank you for your professionalism at the sale uh, on 123 Main Street that you and I just closed on, okay? That's a compliment. That's got something we've got in common. Uh, it's a real easy one for most of you because you've got deals going on. Uh, and then what I want to do very quickly after I do that is I want to try to get the conversation to go to them, to the marketplace, and to them and what is missing or what they need to take their careers or their business to the next level. So it might go something like this. Uh, hey, Press, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but one of the things, I, that was a great listing you had that, that we closed on. So by the way, thanks for taking a great uh, listing because it really, you know, the buyers loved it. It was a great job and I really appreciated your professionalism and how quickly you got back with me on things that's you know that's such a rare thing in, in the in our industry and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate that so I don't know about you but it's been real hard for us to get listings lately because the market's kind of tight and especially in this price range are you finding the same thing or what are some of your struggles that you're having uh, with listings that's going on right now. I'm going to move the conversation to them and their business as fast as possible and I'm going to have a little notepad and I'm going to start listing for what we call value gaps What's the holes that's missing in their business? What do they think they need to do to take their businesses to the next level? And it's just a conversation, so I'm not getting all nervous about it. I'm, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be genuine and be into it. I'm going to listen and and have a conversation back with them. Uh, and this is how I'm going to find out what their first value gap is. So when I find out what their value gap is, let's say for example, Chris said, "Well, I tell you what's been hard for me is finding time to lead generate." I, I'm pretty good at getting listings, but I'm just not getting my lead generation in. I'm going to write down lead generation is a value gap for press. So now I won't do anything about that on this call. I don't solve all of his problems on the first call. I say, well, thank you, press. Have a great day again. Thank you for your professionalism. Now, three, four days down the road or next week when I give press a call back, I'm going to say, hey, press, when you and I were talking about um, our businesses the other day, one of the things that that I heard you say was you really were struggling with prospecting. Uh, and so uh, I, I don't know if this would be a benefit to you, but I have a great list of sources of people that if I just keep it in front of me, then sometimes it'll just spur me to pick up a phone and you know call my database or call one of the, the sources of leads for listings. Would it be of help to you if I gave you that source of leads? And I got that from one of our Keller Williams classes. So you guys are going to get things from your Keller Williams classes. You're going to go look for the stuff because now you've got three or four or five days or six days to go figure out what you're going to give them. And now I'm just going to drop that value piece into their value gap. And then I'm going to try to keep talking to them. And if I can't get any more new value gaps, I'm going to keep dropping things into that one. So the next week or next two or three weeks, I might give them something else. I might say, hey, here's my best script. When I build that relationship deep enough, I'm going to ask them to do what we call take a big step. And that big step might be come shadow me on my uh, lead generation. Or come sh if they had a problem with I don't do very good at converting leads, I might ask them to come on the listing appointment with me. So you get the jest. I'm going to pour in, pour in, give, 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 and then ask. Give, 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 and then ask. I don't ask until I've created enough beholdenness. Uh, that they're that they're probably going to do it. So here's how I know this will work. Years ago, Gary Keller had his first ma uh, mega camp. 22 people were there. Jim and I brought eight of them. Those people had no idea who Keller Williams was. 
They had never, they didn't know who Gary Keller was because he wasn't famous back then. And they came to Austin, Texas to hear him because we asked them to. And that was a very big step. They had to buy plane tickets, pay for hotel rooms. But we had built enough emotional capital into these people that they would have done whatever we asked them to do. Does this make sense? So type in your box if this is making sense to you because um, I want you to be getting this and understanding of where we're headed with this. While you're doing that, I'm going to give you the other script. I'm going to ask another agent for their expertise or their input. Again, it's another thing that people don't get to give enough, and they love to give it. So it could be their thoughts about the market, where it's going, how it's changing, et cetera. And so my, press would go, my script would go like this. Hi, Press. This is Linda. I just want to take a minute and get your professional opinion or expertise on the market shift. Have you noticed the market shifting? Uh, have you noticed uh, houses on the market longer? Whatever's happening in your market, I'm going to ask their opinion uh, or their professional opinion or expertise on that particular topic. So these are my favorite conversation starters. And here's the thing I know, guys. Uh, I'm going to look first and see. Yep, it's making sense. So good. I'm making sense to you. Yep, makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Just, just want some clarity there. But here's the thing I know for sure, guys. If you don't design your life, something or something, someone else will. So we have to decide that we're going to design a life that's full of passive income, that gives us freedom of our time, freedom of our money, uh, and we're going to do that through one of the greatest gifts that takes no money, no liability, no expenses, no leaky toilet calls, any of those things by building our profit share. Uh, it's a gift, but guys, if we don't unwrap it, it's just a gift that sits under the tree that we don't ever get to take advantage of. And I really am encouraging you to understand this is simple, but if you don't focus on it, you're not going to get it. If you're not going to continually do it. And so whether you take our class that starts October the 3rd or whether you, um, you know, whatever you do, you know, David Jones has a great one. Do something to keep this top of mind for you and keep you doing the activities. With ours, we're going to give you homework. We're going to give you a Facebook page where you can give me scenarios and I'll send you a video back about how I would handle certain things. I can help you undo any relationships you've gotten off to the wrong foot. There's lots of things we can do. It's a six weeks program, so you have to be committed. It is recorded, so you can go back and listen to those recordings. Uh, and uh, I'll be your profit share coach that whole six weeks. Uh, our average people, we've taught the course twice. This is our third time. We'll probably maybe do it once a year. If we get enough participation, if we don't, uh, we, we won't. But uh, we've had great participation the last two. So our average uh, attendee gets three recruits in the six weeks. And so if you'll do the work and the activities, it will work. We just had somebody come up to us and said she's on her sixth recruit. She came up to us at Mega Relief. And so um, I'm going to encourage you to do that. What I want to do now is I want to look at the questions that you have and let's see what, uh, what that would, what that would uh, kind of translate to kind of where you could maybe get started. Uh, I think this should be called Profit Share Bold. I like that. I like that. I don't know if Diana would like me stealing her name, but let's just, we'll spill it between ourselves, right? Because uh, absolutely, Profit Share Bold. I love it. Because the thing is, guys, this is really a formula that will also work and help you in your business. Uh, it's my formula for everything. Everything I do in life, this is my formula. And so it's easy. It's simple. I think you can do it. So if you've got questions, um, go ahead and type them in the box because I want you to be able to leave tomorrow and start doing some of this. Uh, can I share how much? Okay. Do you focus on new agents or current agents? Great question. Great question. In the course, we tell you all the different sources of people you can recruit. One of them I tell you is your past clients because I looked around my office one day and eight of my best agents in Denton, Texas are my past clients. So we give you some ideas on how to do that. I don't personally focus on new agents, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I get exhausted thinking about what all they don't know and what all I need to teach them, and so I want to do a hose up to my head and up to theirs. So I want you to encourage you, you need to be able to enjoy this, and I don't enjoy new agents as much as I do mega agents. So I personally go after people with more production because I love their problems and their issues, and I love trying to help them. However, on this course, my son's going to share with you what he's doing. Uh, he's got a great strategy that he's been doing with new agents that works really well. I will also tell you with new agents, you don't have to go as much into all this because they've got a high need and a high demand, and we want to get them to that team leader. 
but we will share with you a few things we think you should do on the front end, like meet with them quickly or give them some little tool that helps them get started in the first 90 days, because if they get to the team leader and they don't remember you, they won't be able to put your name down. And so we're going to clear up some of that stuff that's happening too. Um, can I, can you share how much, how much what? Oh, how much is the course? Okay, so normally the course is 497 With this text and this stuff that you're going to uh, get, you're going to get it at the lowest price available for 297 That's $200 off. And the average recruit, I don't care where you are in market centers, we average, it's actually a little bit higher than this, but we say, what if it was 1500 per recruit per year? Very easily, you and you got three. If you did the average of what most people do, you're going to get your money back plus some. So uh, I think that was your question: is how much is the course? What day of the week and time of day is the course? I think we're going to. It's a Tuesday at one central. One, I think it's one central, one or one central. If you'll go into this, you'll get a link that'll tell you a lot more information about it. Uh, also, it is recorded. And you also can go back and listen to them before the, that way you can be ready for the next week because I will sign you homework because I need you out there in the field doing this stuff so I can help get you better and better at this as fast as possible. I promise what will happen is you will start thinking automatically yourself. I don't think anything but recruiting. Last week I did a webinar and on that webinar a guy won one of my books. And when I look down at the list of who we need to send the book to, this was through some other company. This was through Secrets of Successful Agents. The guy happened to be in the town I was going to the next day. So rather than just stick his book in the mail, I got a hold of him, got his cell number from somebody, texted him and asked him if he wanted to do breakfast. He did breakfast with us the next morning. But that's my, that's my, my brain is working that way because I've been doing this for so long. When you get in the habit of this, you're going to immediately start to see things that you didn't see before as, as, as it relates to recruiting. And I'm so excited for you because thinking recruiting is very dollar productive, very. Uh, so I have been trying to recruit a top producer in another office who has canceled several appointments. Any suggestions? Took me five years to join us, first approach, and I said, no, nope, not interested. Okay, so here's the thing. More than likely, you, uh, you're going to for the appointment too soon, so don't do that. Uh, do a phone call, do several phone calls first, try to figure out what the value gap of this person is and drop something, just start dropping some things. Remember, this may take a long time, you've got to be okay with that. People come on their timing, they don't come on mine or yours. Uh, and like Gary Keller said to me one year, that does not bother me, Linda, I'm going to be in this business for a career, not just a year. If they come nine months from now or nine years from now, it doesn't matter. So I want you to, you know, Give yourself the space and time because they will come on their time. But if you haven't invested and poured into them, uh, you know, I always say there's two real estate companies in every agent's mind, the one they're with and the one they would be with. I also don't say the words Keller Williams or KW ever, and I never talk to them about profit share because it's the least, you know, down at the bottom reason why anybody's interested. They have to bring up Keller Williams twice before I'll even talk to them about Keller Williams. So these are some intricate pieces of this that are very important. Uh, so what other questions do we have here, Press? Um, tips on recruiting a new market center to a new market center's location. Oh, awesome. Pre-launch. Okay, so here's the thing. Remember, I make the question is, what are some tips you have on recruiting to a new market center location pre-launch? Okay, so here's the thing. I don't make it about the location. I make it about them. So I'm never going to change my strategy. I'm not going to call and say, oh, I'm so excited to tell you about a new location we have. I don't do that. I call and talk about them. I will not even tell them about our new location until they bring up Keller Williams to me. So remember, they got to bring it up twice to me, so it could take a little while for them to do that. If I start trying to do this too soon, they're going to say things like, I'm happy where I'm at. And by the way, if they do, they should not be able to say, I'm happy where I'm at if you will follow the strategies that I'm telling you. They're only going to be able to say that if you're calling them and saying, hey, I want to tell you about where our new market center is going. Or, hey, I want to tell you how great you should join our market center is. You know, all those things, that's, that's going to cause them to put up the red flag. So, but if I did get someone to say, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. If I did get someone to say, I'm, you know, I'm happy where I'm at, uh, or you're trying to recruit me. Let's say they're saying they're trying to say you're trying to recruit me. I'd say, well, of course, Press. I'd love to recruit you. I'd love to be in business with you somewhere someday. You're in a, you're a great agent. 
However, what I really like to do is talk to you about the market. Whatever I'm talking about, I go back to that subject. So I just go ahead and acknowledge what they said and say, well, of course, Chris, I'd love for us to be in business at the same place someday. But here's what I know for sure. When you see that there's something in this company that's going to help you take your life and your family's life to the next level, I won't have to recruit you. You'll just want to join our company already by yourself. So, ha so can we just agree, I hope someday we're in business together. And then I just move on. I don't ignore it. I don't act like no, whatever. I just give value, but I give the value that's important to them. Um, so what do I say when they bring it up twice? Well, the first thing they usually say is this. Well, you know, Linda, now I've never brought up KW to them. I've never brought up Keller Williams to them. Here's what they'll say. Well, you know, Linda, if I were going to go somewhere else, I'd join Keller Williams. That's typically the first thing they say. And I say, that's fantastic. I'd love to be in business with you someday. Now I just keep going. I keep going back to what we were talking about. Now the second time, what they'll typically say is, hey, if I were interested in Keller Williams, how does it work? What do you pay? All that stuff. And that's when I say, those are great questions. And I have to tell you, we have a great person in our system that knows all of that stuff. And they're the team leader. And I'd love to have them, if you wouldn't be offended, I'd love to have them contact you. That's how I do it. And so if you will follow this process and don't get ahead of yourself and don't get excited and don't, don't try to be a recruiter when you're not trained to do it, you're trained to build relationships. That's what we're training you to do. The relationships will automatically build. And I think I've kept you guys open. Here's my request. Do this for yourself. Do it for your family. And do it for your legacy. This is a valuable opportunity, and not enough of our people are taking advantage of it. So I'd love for you to join us on October the 3rd when we get started, uh, and I'd love for you to change your life and your family's life forever through this wonderful gift called Profit Share. I love you guys way more than you ever know, and I'm going to constantly be preaching passive income and asking you the wealth determining question if I see you. So love you guys. Thank you for your time today, and hope to see you in the program. Take care.